Good morning or afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Implementing Your Revenue Recognition Process, How to Meet the New Standards and Automate Ongoing Compliance webinar presented by Heinen Associates. We are pleased to offer this complimentary webinar each month that cover a wide range of finance and accounting topics. I'm Shannon Reddy, your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we start, let's take a moment to cover a few housekeeping items. All audio lines are muted. Please use our chat feature to ask questions. We will save time at the end for Q&A, but please use the question button on the left to ask questions throughout the presentation. The webinar is being recorded. A copy of the webinar presentation and its recording will be sent out to all registrants later today. Your active participation is important throughout the session. In order to receive CPE credit for this session, you will need to be connected for a minimum of 120 minutes and must answer at least 75% of the polling questions included throughout the presentation. Immediately following this webinar, you will be directed to an online evaluation form that must be submitted in order to receive your CPE certificate for the course. Please check your inbox later today for a follow-up email that will include a link to the evaluation as well. And sorry, that's for a minimum of 75 minutes. Our presenters today are Mike Parker, Greg Fall, and Michelle Carr, all partners in our Denver office. Mike oversees the Heinz technology practices and brings over 25 years of helping customers gain more value through better using technology to optimize their business. Mike's experience is across a broad set of industries and geographies. Greg provides a wide range of audit and accounting services for both public and privately held companies. He assists clients with financial reporting and complex transactions such as initial public offerings, IPOs, private offerings, and mergers and acquisitions, and he has extensive expertise in debt and equity finances, share-based compensation, income tax accounting, purchase price accounting, and SEC reporting. He focuses in the alternative energy, technology, and manufacturing and distribution industries. Michelle began her career in public accounting with Heine Associates in 1999. Since that time, she has primarily worked with technology and software firms, manufacturing distribution companies, and clients in the mining sector. Michelle serves both privately held companies and publicly traded corporations, overseeing a variety of assurance, engagements, and consulting projects. Her assurance work has ranged from audits for SEC and IFRS engagements to due diligence services and other agreed-upon procedures. In addition, Michelle provides technical support on complex accounting issues, advises on revenue recognition, inventory, as well as matters of impairment, goodwill, and mergers and acquisition transactions. Thank you for attending today, and I would now like to introduce Mike Parker, Greg Fall, and Michelle Carr. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Greg Fall, and we are in part four of this four-part webinar. I know probably not everybody has joined all the way through, but for those of you who have, welcome back. Uh, the agenda for today, uh, primarily we're going to be focused on, on systems and processes to implement the new revenue recognition standard. Uh, first, we'll do a, a, a pretty quick recap of the first three webinars, uh, talk a little bit more about the old versus the new standards, uh, an approach to meeting the new standards, uh, project planning complexities, then an implementation overview, accounting and revenue system ne systems needs, key system functionality, and we'll go into a summary series wrap up with Q&A at the end. And, and again, I'd encourage you, if you have questions, feel free to submit those as we go through the process, um, as we get to uh, breaking points, we'll either address those at that time or at the end of the uh, of this webinar. Um, with that, I think we're going to go to our first polling question. That is correct. Thank you, Greg. In part two of this series, there were a list of outputs defined in how to measure progress, which is not one of the input, sorry, which is not one of the identified output methods. 
A, monies paid by the customer, B, appraisals of results achieved, C, milestones, D, time elapsed, E, units produced or delivered. Please make your selection now. Okay, it looks like uh, most folks put money's, money's paid by the, uh, the customer. That would be uh, correct on that. Um, so with that, let's, just, let's move on to a, a quick recap of webinars part, parts one, two, and three. Uh, so going back to the beginning here, we talked about the uh, timeline for this, which is, which is you know, coming near. Uh, the timeline is different. Implementation uh, time frame is different between public and private companies. As you can see here for public, uh, really the first quarter of 2018 for calendar year, public companies, private companies uh, one, one year later again for uh, calendar year companies. Uh, we, we went through in detail, in the, and this really covered the first two webinars, is, is just walking through these five steps, um, identifying the contract with the customer, identifying the separate performance obligation, then determining the transaction price, allocation of that transaction price, and, and finally recognizing revenue when the performance obligation is satisfied. Uh, next in part three, uh, to me a little bit more fun in, in that we're looking at uh, you know what, what some of the public companies have done out there from the standpoint of uh, we have had a, a handful of early implementers, so we've been able to look at what, what those companies have, have filed in their public documents. Um, we then went into looking at some of the presentation and disclosure requirements. Uh, along with uh, uh, a lot of examples that were, although we didn't have a chance to go through all the examples, uh, there were a lot of examples that we were able to pull out of some of those early implementers. Talked about internal control considerations. Um, you know, just a, really a caution not to overlook the fact that with, with these changes and with any new standard really, but uh, in particular due to the uh, complexity of this new standard, uh, it's very important to make sure that the internal controls do get adjusted accordingly um, as needed for the implementation of the standard. Uh, next, we talked about uh, some of the external auditor considerations, what to expect from, from your external auditors. Uh, so it's heavily focused on uh, PCOB uh, risk alert that, that recently has come out. I uh, went through a sample implementation plan, and then John Monahan, uh, one of our tax partners, joined us to go through uh, some of the income tax accounting considerations. If anybody was unable to attend any of those, those, those webcasts are available, and we can get you uh, uh, links to those as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Mike Parker. Um, Oh, we've got, I'm sorry, one more polling question. <laughs> it wouldn't be right if I didn't forget one of those during that. It's all good. Um, question two, or polling question two. According to part three of this series, what was the impact of, er of the early revenue recognition standard adoption on Windows 10 revenue from Microsoft? A, remain the same. B, decreased. C, increased. D, was not the is closed. Please make your selection now. And these first couple polling questions are somewhat tricky from the standpoint that if you, you weren't in attendance, then it might be, uh, obviously, it would be very hard to 
to answer, but yeah, the, the, the answer on this one is that it, that it increased basically with the, the Microsoft example that we went through. Um, with their Windows 10 licenses, they are now able to recognize that revenue up front as opposed to recognizing that over the period of a related subscription agreement. And now we will move to Mike Parker. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, so as, as Greg said, I mean, a lot of the, the upfront was really talking about you know the the accounting piece and the audit piece of it. So really, just kind of doing a, a very quick um, comparison at some high level in the old rules versus new rules and, and why they you know they came to be and, and what exists. So you know the existing revenue recognition guidance it lacked consistency across industries. Uh, there was disparities between U.S. GAAP and IFRS, um, and really also didn't address certain types of arrangements. Uh, so the new standard is really aimed at reducing or eliminating consistencies, uh, improving the comparability between uh, GAAP and IFRS, and then also eliminating gaps in guidance. Um, the new standard will, we believe, significantly affect current revenue recognition practices of many companies. Um, and particularly the ones we feel that are going to be the, I guess, most impacted will be uh, technology, uh, aerospace defense, automotive, communications, engineering construction, entertainment media, pharmaceutical life sciences are just a few that we believe are, will be significantly impacted. But we still feel there's, a, I think most organizations will be impacted at some level. It's just a matter of how your contracts are done. Um, so talking about ASC 606 in co contrast to its predecessor, uh, it's really principle-based um, versus a rules-based um, framework. And, and the goal of the new guidance is it's really twofold. One is, again, to eliminate some of the industry-specific guidance, um, allow for more transparent and balanced reporting across companies. Uh, and secondly, to allow companies more judgment in applying accounting guidance to kind of meet the ever-changing needs of their businesses. Uh, so it went from a you know, rules-based to principle-based, again, kind of got right out of the industry-specific pieces. Uh, again, I talked about the convergence from GAP, um, with GAP in uh, IFRS, and then getting collectability kind of out of the equation. So uh, really kind of the high-level uh, comparison between the old and the new and what to expect and kind of why the, the new came into being. So next, um, talk about the, the challenges of uh, adopting to the new standard um, and what are companies facing. So PwC did a, a good survey last year on the challenges people um, are facing. Uh, and, every, and each business is going to have their own unique challenges, their own unique uh, pieces. But it was interesting to see what people were really um, struggling with or, or felt like would be uh, – complex to implement it within their business. So the most common challenge was contract review, and that's both the current contracts and ongoing contract process elements, items. Um, you know, many times in an organization, this is, it's a siloed process. Uh, it's handled by a specific department or it's handled differently across business units. Um, you know, you got, again, you may have sales within each um uh, Business unit, you may have sales that's kind of its own department. Uh, you may have this spread across your business. Um, and so to be able to identify and manage all the complexity and all the items that are going to be needed, as you'll see in this webinar, um, it's a very complicated process. And right now, it's typically a very manual process in how that revenue gets um, managed and, and entered into your financial books today. Um, and we believe the complexity is just going to add um, to the case for automation as you move forward. Um, you know, the ability to review contracts, even get contracts. Some clients have expressed concerns and just being able to put their fingers on contracts across their entire business um, to identify and, and establish revenue recognition rules for each type of contract. Uh, before it goes out the door, uh, and what type of contracts am I willing to put out to customers uh, based on these new rules and my, my need to uh, adhere to them um, 
you know, again, a lot of this is manual. A lot of it is uh, very difficult. A lot of it's error prone. Uh, and so we see, again, the more complexity that's introduced, the more need for automation and to ensure you remain in compliance uh, with the standard. Um, also, many people uh, you know, really cited the ability to identify and create all the documentation on the processes. Um, again, the, the process right now is, is usually very manual. It's very um, uh, specific to uh, an individual group. Um, and again, as you have to step back and really holistically across your business implement this, the, the different components into um, a, a applying to the standard, then we believe, again, a lot of that's going to need to be you know, pulled into um, the right roles and the right systems and the right processes. Um, and really, um, we'll have to go through a, a maturity process within your business. Um, you know, and then last but definitely not least, um, just the need to bring in processes and systems up to date. Um, and that's really going to be a lot of our topic for today. Uh, so with that, let's talk about these complexities in implementing. Um, so this is by no means an exhaustive list of um, complexities that you're going to encounter or may potentially encounter. Uh, but it, it hopefully does give you a listing of some of the things that we've identified as um, you know, areas of planning and then, and then high, medium, low complexity. Because, I think, again, I think every business is going to be different. Um, and I think it, for a lot of people, this will be a complex project. Uh, and obviously, it's very important to your business because it's how you, you recognize revenue um, on a daily basis. Um, but I think the the level of complexity is really based in each each factor, and then what is the complexity level of each of those factors um, within your industry? And are you going to industry standards? Are there certain types of contracts or contractual elements are you know expected within your pieces? So some of the areas that we looked at, like again, number of business units, how broad and how complex is your business in general? And what are those affected? Uh, again, you may have different lines of business and or different departments that have very different uh, capabilities, very different customer bases, very different contractual arrangements. Uh, and each of those factor into uh, you know, the overall project as, as a business, your need and, and ability to comply with the, the new standards. Um, Again, we talked about the, the ability to collect and evaluate existing agreements and, and identifying you know, future agreements. What are going to be my constructs for my agreements going forward? Um, that will be another factor that, again, may not be consistent across your business. It may be uh, varying across each of these business units departments as we talked about. Um, the number of contracts and deals. Uh, how many of these do you do a year? Um, if, you know, if you're – dealing with a small number of clients and number of contracts that's issued per year. You know, your, your process is probably going to be more simple, more straightforward. If you're dealing with thousands of contracts each year, then obviously um, that's going to require a lot more precision and a lot, lot, lot more coordination. And this is where literally uh, automation can play one of the, the biggest factors. Um, and then non-standard, we'll get into non-standard uh, agreements later in the webinar, but what is that number? How many do you adjust? Do you do upsells? Do you do contract renegotiations in the middle? Um, there's all these pieces of how do you do business, and each one of those has an impact on uh, you know your ability and, and uh, the process in which you need to implement to adhere to the new standard. Um, and then obviously we talked about systems, so. Um, what systems do you have in place today? Um, do you need just to update your current system? Do you need to upgrade or do you need to go find a whole new system that can manage this process for you? So those are just a few of the kind of more common areas, um, you know, that are going to factor into and that you need to look at as you define out uh, how you're going to go about implementing uh, your adherence to the new standard. So with that, talk about kind of that approach and, and take a step back a little bit from the tactical and really look at um, how you would manage the complexity and what that might mean to 
your finance organization. I think uh, some of the clients we've talked to are really looking at this as a way for finance to become more integral in this kind of strategic growth and the strategic structure and revenue of the business. Um, and a few areas that uh, we've noted here are, um, you know, leverage the need to com comply as a change agent. Uh, a lot of people have wanted to bring, uh, bring about change in their uh, contractual process and their order management process and their sales process. Um, and it brings more rigor and visibility into the revenue attainment and recognition. Um, you can really shed light on which of your customers, contracts, types of business, add the most value and add the most revenue to your firm and, and can really help your business grow both, again, strategically and profitably. So being able to provide that information out on a, a, a more frequent and more visible basis is, it can really help your finance organization be seen as more strategic as a business. Um, you know, while you have to pass your audit and test by all your auditors, as, as uh, the auditors on this call are probably smiling about, um, this can be seen as a way to, to really, again, talk about that visibility to your investors, to your executives about um, how am I complying, what am I, you know, what am I, uh, how am I adhering to it, and really the, we talked about internal controls, and we'll talk about that throughout make sure that I have better visibility and better controls across more of my business to ensure that I'm, again, executing my business on a daily basis um, in the right way. Um, and the third one really, um, you know, right now sometimes finance is um, seen as an inhibitor to growth. I mean, salespeople um, will, will many times position that and then and really I think you can turn it around and be a driver of strategic growth again being able to provide a lot more uh, data and, and information about um, what how are we gaining the revenue what does that revenue look like by business unit by department um, can really allow finance again to help be that strategic driver uh, a driver of strategic growth and really you know, have a seat at the table in what do you sell, how do you sell it, and how do you service your customers. Um, and then I'll go back to systems. Um, you know, really a lot of it is handled right now through Excel or manual processes. Uh, I think as you get further into this and you get more um, complexity and you get more uh, need for that visibility that we've talked about, uh, doing it through Excel and doing it manually just isn't going to cut it. So identifying those systems that can uh, provide it uh, in an automated fashion, in a flexible manner, um, and be able to change as this also continues to evolve. So now to our next polling question. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, Point question three, what is the expected impact of the new rec revenue recognition standard on your business? A, low, B, medium, C, high. Please make your selection now. Great, thank you. Yeah, great. So um, right at 50% felt like it was this was going to be a low complexity, so that's good to hear. Um, I think, again, across um, many businesses, we're finding a very broad disparity. So good to hear that 50% uh, low, 35, almost 36 medium. So that's uh, a, a good dis uh, dispersion of people that are going to have uh, different levels of complexity to deal with. So on to the next, um, talking about implementation. Um, you know, it's easy to approach this as a kind of finance-only project and it's handled within a department and really tactical, um, but, you know, maybe even a necessary evil. Um, but I think, again, we, we talked about a way to, to look at this across your business to holistically get in front of this, um, eliminate errors, omissions that may even be, exist today um, that you can then take out, you know, use this as a, uh, an impetus to, to move that out of your business. Um, but in order to com comply correctly and efficiently, I mean, I think you just have to treat this like any other strategic enterprise project. 
Um, you know, you have to uh, assign the right budget. Uh, what is it going to cost? And to do that, you have to know the scope. I mean, you have to know, you talk about high complexity, mid complexity, low complexity. What does that look like? Um, you know, and why is it low or medium or high? And, and making sure that you can define what all needs to happen in order for your processes, your systems, your people uh, to be uh, implemented correctly and in, in the right place correctly uh, to ensure that you know you are compliant. Um, you know the dedicated project team, making sure that you have people on this project that are just not the people who are available, but uh, people who know the processes, that know your business, know where your business wants to go, and can really be that core project team to define out what this looks like in a future state. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, your project timeline. Um, you know, how long is it going to take to implement this? I mean, there are some hard deadlines, as Greg said at the beginning, but uh, what does each stage and each step look like, and what does that timeline look like? You know, each firm has a very different capacity for change and a very different speed in which it operates. <laughs> um, so know yours and really make sure that you have you know, that right timeline for your business and you're not painting yourself in a corner and um, you know, that you're starting in a timely manner. I mean, there's, you, you can start, you know, already should be started probably, um, but really in earnest, uh, you know, start as soon as possible to make sure that you are uh, meeting the, the stated deadlines. Um, and then, again, goals and objectives. What are you trying to achieve out of it? Just like any other implementation, um, go into it with a set of goals and objectives so when you get to the back end of it, you, you know, did you succeed? And, uh, you know, success isn't defined by I was on time and on budget, but it's, it's did I really meet what the goals and objectives were for the business? And that's something that I think a lot of people skip over in this type of project is, really having that stakeholders conversation and really understanding what does the business need or what can the business gain through the execution of this project. <clears throat> so some key considerations. Um, again, I, I found don't estimate, underestimate the time and effort. I think go through the time to assess your requirements uh, and really understand all of those use cases. Um, you know, you're so many times you find the one-off exception or we only do this, you know, a few times a year, but again, it, it's still going to be um, something you've got to make sure you're in compliance with. Uh, I think you'll be amazed at the number of random spreadsheets that are across your organization that, that track uh, different sets of information or different, you know, transactions as they come in and out of your business. Um, I talked about the stakeholders. Um, you know, make sure you identify and, and, and engage with all stakeholders. I mean, that's, again, it can be sales, order management, finance operations, your executive team, internal, external audit. Um, what are all those stakeholders and what are they expecting out of it? And again, that goes back to, this goes back to really, again, the goals and objectives, making sure that you can, you know, show that this project is successful. Um, you do want to engage with your auditors, um, you know, understand what are those controls, what are the new controls, what are, what's your auditor going to ask for and expect as you move into your audit, um, formal audit process. Um, and make sure, again, all of that's built in up front. You don't want to design for something and implement something and then right, turn right around and realize you're going to have a, a material weakness or, a, you know, a deficiency that your auditor brings out. Um, and then, Going back to the system side, I mean, know what to look for in the solution. I mean, you're going to have new processes. You may have new roles. You may have, you may need a, a new system. Uh, your, your, your current system may not be able to handle this level of um, reporting and tracking. Uh, so know that and know what your, your system needs are and incorporate that into the overall. I mean, it's great that we, we look at the accounting piece and it's great that we look at the compliance piece, but at the end of the day, um, you're, this is going to be a set of transactions that happens every day in your business. And how are you going to manage that um, as you grow, as you potentially become more distributed, 
um, get into new lines of business or new departments pop up or, you know, whatever that looks like. How are you going to manage that as you go forward? Um, and really that's a, a very important aspect of how, you know, what, how you're going to define whether you're successful or not in this project. So let's talk about the stages in the implementation. Uh, so, so far we've really kind of talked more about the approach and some complexities and considerations, but uh, let's talk about the, the approach and the stages in which you'll go in to implement this. I um, mean, again, just like any other business solution project or enterprise project, uh, you've got to approach it in a, system, a systematic manner, um, and, but also it's got to be tailored to your business. I mean, again, you talk about low, medium, high complexities. The approach and, and requirements for each of you are, are probably very, very different. Um, and each of these stages really can, cascades into the next, um, and, and each is equally important in uh, making sure that you're successful. Again, you're, you're meeting the needs of the business and you're meeting the needs of the um, all your stakeholders. Um, so that's a, a huge uh, success criteria and, and whether this overall project is going to be seen as successful and a way to, to really, again, drive the, the growth of your business. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about um, a few of these, and so I'll go, go into each stage in, in a lot more detail over the next few slides to, to really map out each, each stage separately. So stage one, which is the accounting assessment and process determination, and really this has been the focus um, for the pr three previous webinars, so I really won't spend a lot of time on it today. Um, you know, the main the technical accounting activities are performed in the assessment are really, again, we talked about the contract evaluations. We want to document our accounting policies, how, you know, what are the methods we're going to use to comply. Um, we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, again, mapping out our overall accounting processes and, and uh, policies. Uh, we want to and, and develop a transition plan. How are we getting from our current process and our current standards to future process and future standards? And again, making sure that from an audit uh, and process perspective, we really have a, a clean, uh, you know, bill of health of, you know, where we're at, where we're going, and how, how are we going to get there? Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about adoption method. There's two different um, adoption methods, full retrospective and modified retrospective. Not going to really go into those in, in detail today. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, it's how am I going to report my, you know, my pro forma financial statements and, and really, again, map that transition period and, and make sure that I can pull that disclosures out in, um, in an appropriate fashion. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to watch the other webinars, as Greg stated at the beginning, uh, here are the links to them. Uh, they are on the Hind YouTube channel. Uh, you will get a copy of this presentation, so it has an uh, easy link, but uh, they're all out there on our YouTube channel, so you feel free to watch those. You can uh, hear uh, Greg and Michelle and um, talk about each of the, the pieces that Greg spoke about at the beginning of the presentation. So stage two, um, really the operational impact uh, analysis, um, you know, we've got disclosures. Um, there's a lot of technical accounting activities that are going to carry over from that assessment stage. Um, one of the key activities uh, is going to be you're drafting your disclosures uh, that are required by the new revenue recognition standard. Um, you know, ASC 6 and 6 requires entities to disclose both the quantitative and qualitative information. Uh, that enables users of the financial statement to understand the nature, amount, timing, and uncertainty of revenue and cash flows from contracts with customers. So what does that mean to you? I mean, again, you've got to figure out what you're going, what you do today and what you're going to do tomorrow. Um, and then you've got to, uh, you know, really map all of that out. Again, and it's not just reporting. So a lot of this is going to be process change. How are you going to do things differently and what is going to be that, those required changes in processes potentially across your business. Um, <clears throat> and what does that look like? Um, you know, uh, there is potential for headcount and job responsibility changes or additions. There's maybe you're adding more to, to someone's plate, uh, but you've got to account for, you know, new activities, new uh, 
information, the reporting, all of that, and where is all of that going to come from? Um, and you know, how is that going to be accounted for within your business, and who's going to be responsible for it? Um, you know, really talking about you know the again audit and tax implications. Again, that was part of the last webinar, and we won't go into a lot of detail, but um, you know, you have to really have you know information about your contract assets and liabilities uh, and changes, being able to ma manage changes to that, that information, um, what revenue you're going to recognize in a current period, um, I, I, what's your contract liability, has that change. Um, again, looking at um, what are you doing in prior periods, what have you done in prior periods, what do you need to, how do you, do you need to potentially change in that, um, and performance obligations. What what do you owe your customers? I mean, are there specific goods or services? Did you sign up for payment terms? Uh, are there other obligations or provisions in the contract that really uh, changes how you recognize the revenue uh, for that particular agreement? Um, again, on, on a co contract by contract basis. Um, you know, if you even if you think that you're you're not going to have a significant impact. Um, I think it's likely that the, your disclosures uh, and the information required to prepare those disclosures is going to change. Uh, so in, in light of that, I mean, you should prepare you know, draft disclosures in accordance with the new revenue standard and, and review those with, you know, your, you know, whoever within your business that's appropriate for uh, and ensure that they, they meet the, the objective and the, the uh, the needs that were, are required in ASC 606, um, you know, and, and additionally, I mean, you should perform a gap analysis of what's missing. I mean, you may have data that you don't collect today. Uh, what is that new data that I'm going to need, or what is the changes to the data that I collect today um, that will be different in order to meet, you know, these disclosure requirements? Um, so there's a lot of implications as to, you know, impacting your your organizational, your operational, your your process pieces. Um, and at the end of the day, you just need to perform the analysis on what that future state's going to look like uh, and making sure that you're designing uh, to meet those requirements and really take a requirements-based approach. Um, yeah, that's a, and this is a key milestone is really having that uh, documented and understood before you really move forward in you know, implementing or fully designing out any you know, solution part of the, the, the project. So next we'll talk about <clears throat> stage three, which is data process and system analysis. Um, we, we talked a little bit about um, the different types of uh, people and information, um, but Again, this isn't just about finance. I mean, you got to look to the other groups that are impacted. Um, you know, you may have a deal desk. You may have sales comp. So you may have to pull HR in. How am I compensating my employ my salespeople? Um, IT. If again, if we're talking about systems, um, there there's a lot of different disparate groups that may have a component of the overall solution. Um, you know, project tracking client billing, your support group, do you provide functions to your ongoing customers that could then now pose a, an issue to how you recognize the revenue on a specific agreement? Um, what constitutes a sale? I mean, what, what am I giving to my client in a good or service that then you know, constitutes a sale that I can then start to recognize individual elements of that revenue? Um, and we talked a little bit about the data aspect, but I think that's an extremely, extremely important facet is do I capture and do I have the right data from the right people? Um, you know, you're going to have to do potentially different um, financial statements, disclosures, um, your, your accounting assessments. I mean, really, they're only as good as the underlying data that you have that supports them. And just – given the sheer number of additional you know, estimations and calculations that a company is going to have to perform uh, to fully determine the impact of this new guidance, you know, the completeness and accuracy of the underlying data 
really has never been more crucial. Um, again, based on our experience, uh, many companies have just maintained spreadsheets or, you know, to some degree, it's honestly tribal knowledge um, to track some of this information or, you know, things like commissions are over in an HR system and they're not really in a financial system. What's backlog look like? Is that in salesforce.com or is that, um, you know, again, out in your CRM system that really doesn't feed back into your financials. Um, you know, all of this is potential data that needs to be understood and mapped and collected and, and uh, identified for what does that future state look like within your business and how are you going to utilize this information uh, on a go-forward basis. So that's really the, the, the big thing you're trying to do is make sure that you've accounted for every use case, for every data item, every contract type, every uh, disclosure and reporting requirement, everything that you're going to need in that future state, you need to map out up front so that as you get into uh, the design of the process and the design of the system, you do understand the, uh, the underlying components and you, you're not caught off guard or by surprise as you get later in the project and all of a sudden you realize that you either don't have the data or you don't have the right data or you're not collecting the data in a, a way that's um, scalable going forward or auditable on a go-forward basis. So continue on stage three. Now, once you've kind of, as you go through this, I mean, our recommendation, again, treating this like an enterprise solutions project, um, I recommend going through and really creating a, a process flow. And with, with that process flow, you incorporate two very key components. Um, and one of those is data, as we talked about. The other is, again, roles and responsibilities. Who's going to own each step in the overall process? Because, again, again I think there are going to be, new steps, there are going to be different activities that will go into each step, um, and defining who will do that, and then defining does that person have the right knowledge and or training to perform those steps um, is, a, is a big change management aspect of this whole project and can really define, again, whether it's successful in your business. Um, but data and process really kind of come together at this point. And, and make sure that, again, for each step of the process, I have defined, it defined correctly, and then I know what data, I know what roles, and laying that out in, you know, uh, Visio chart or whatever, you know, path, you know, whatever tool you want to use is, is very important. Uh, you may use, you know, your system may have a tool that is within it that you can leverage as a workflow piece. Um, but you use whatever is available to you, um, you know, an example of this is really, I mean, having that, again, having all of these pieces rolled up into one cohesive plan. I think this is the, the summary statement for that. Um, you know, and again, knowing what methods you have to use, what uh, are you having to relook at historical data, and do I have that historical data if I use the full retrospective method? Um, knowing, again, timing of data timing of process, things of that nature. Um, am I going to, in the modified retrospective, am I going to create, you know, two sets of books? Am I doing it that way? Uh, and what does that require of me and my business? Um, so I, I think, and I think it has a, could have a very persuasive, pervasive, excuse me, impact on um, many areas of business. And we haven't really even talked about IT uh, because it, it will impact your systems. Um, whether, again, whether you have to just do an evaluation of your existing system capabilities, whether you have to upgrade. Uh, many of the larger ERP systems have a, a, a advanced or revenue recognition module that I don't know if you use today, um, but maybe it's just as, as adding on that module into, again, your existing financial systems. Could be that the finance system you use doesn't, uh, have that capability, and you would need to look at alternative uh, sources. Um, so you really have to look at, uh, make sure, again, IT is a, a stakeholder um, in this process because, again, uh, I, I think as you get more and more, having the, the manual steps and the manual processes 
is going to become more and more difficult. Uh, and as I showed earlier in the slide, really force um, a much more tactical approach and a much more inhibitive approach to growing your business. So the next thing we'll talk about is uh, what I call a fit gap. And so as Greg talked about <clears throat> the five-step model, um, both today as well as in the previous webinars, um, what you really need to do, again, is map out uh, and do a fit gap for each of those stages and, and understanding um, how you're going to account for each of those steps in the, in the model. Um, you know, we talked about data. We talked about, you know, process flow. But we also need to, again, this is looping in systems and functionality and, and how am I going to capture that information? How am I going to gain the appropriate approvals? How am I going to assign the right revenue plans? How am I going to assign start and end dates? Um, how, how am I, and again, am I capturing all the data that I need? Uh, what approvals am I going to have to get within the business? Uh, is that going to change from what I do today? Am I going to pull some of this out of my departmental um, process and pull it into a more corporate process? Uh, and what does that change bring both from, a, again, a, you know, what I put in the market, what am, I, what am I willing to contract for through how do I manage uh, those contracts and the revenue implications uh, associated with each? Um, you may, you know, again, you, you, how do I automate as much of this? How do I have indicators on whether I'm going to be able to recognize a particular item or not, and what is that going to mean to um, you know my financial statement on a, a monthly or quarterly basis? Um, you know, again, I, 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 as what I tried to show here in this visual is as you move through the five stages that are listed in blue, You've got to kind of tie it back to your contract process, to your revenue recognition process today, and, and understand that delta, and understand uh, I'll go back to the process, data, and system components all wrapped in together um, to, in order to make sure that you're mapping and managing this at a detailed enough level so that you don't get to uh, the point where you're trying to implement this into your business and there's a lot of surprises or you found that you've missed um, you know, particular uh, areas or particular use cases, or you put your, you know, your, your business in a, a situation where they're not in compliance with the standards. So next we talked about, I mean, so far we really talked a lot about you know, implementation and, and that following that, I'll call it, you know, enterprise project best practice. Um, but the other thing you really got to look at as part of this is the sustainability. So stage four is really how, how do I create a sustainable process and a sustainable structure? Uh, and as you, you can easily ask your auditor, having a spreadsheet that uh, isn't going to be considered sustainable, it's not going to, um, it, it's, probably going to pose you a lot of problems and questions as you go through your audit process. Um, you know, can I, who can go in and, and manipulate the information? Who has access to that spreadsheet? How does that spreadsheet get created? Uh, what's the error rate in just entering information in manually? All of those things are really challenges that you have to solve as a business. Um, so it's really not enough just to define the right accounting structures and making sure again that I'm 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 doing the right things from an accounting perspective. I've got the right rules in place, and um, it's really um, again how do I have a, a a plan and a process and a mechanism to correctly uh, execute this process? Hopefully, every single day of, of your business um, and every contract uh, on an ongoing basis, um, and and really. I just I don't see Excel as a viable model for that. I think that's going to create far more issues than it's going to solve, uh, and potentially again be an inhibitor to you know having a successful audit and or growing your business. Um, you know, and and it also it's mainly labor intensive. 
you know, you're going to have people that are just going to, you know, spend time on this process that really don't add value to growing your business. Um, and, I mean, again, we talked about having your auditor as part of this project uh, at each stage. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a great testament of not only how am I implementing it, but how am I going to execute the process on a daily basis and what does that mean to my business and what does that mean to, uh, you know, my adherence and compliance as, as I go forward. Um, and generally speaking, manual processes and throwing bodies at it, it really is a sustainable long-term solution. Um, so we do recommend looking at a system um, that can automate as much of it as possible. Uh, and, and that may be an incremental approach for some, for some firms. Uh, they may not have the time or the resource or the budget to, to fully automate the way they want to. But, again, I think starting down that path and starting that approach is the right thing to do, uh, both from a, you know, again, a process, compliance, a reporting perspective. All of those capabilities are really inherently tied into your uh, financial and revenue recognition systems uh, and are obviously very important to, to your business and, and how your business is you know, run and valued and, and perceived on a day-in and day-out basis. So we're Mike, doing our next... Yep. We have our next polling question. Um, what do you expect to be the most difficult, difficult step in your implementation of the new standard? A, stage one, accounting assessment and process determination, B, stage two, operational impact analysis and design, C, stage three, data process and system analysis, design and implementation, stage four, or D, stage four, sustainability. Please make your selection now. Well, great. We have a um, pretty pretty good split here. Um, so the, the leader of 40% of accounting assessment process determination, uh, but right behind it is data process systems. Um, so I, I, it, I think, again, a lot of this, they go hand in hand, but I, it's interesting to see the, the split here um, with sustainability as the kind of lower end. Uh, and I do think if you do a great job of, of doing the upfront work, I think the sustainability part more naturally falls into place. So. Um, very interesting to, to get everyone's feedback. So let's talk about the system side of it. Um, again, we've talked about a lot more of the process and the the, the implementation project based piece of it. But uh, really, you know, let's talk about some high level needs of what you will need in that in that systems component. Um, again, we talked about you know most people right now are using spreadsheets based on what we've heard or or doing it as a manual entry into their financial systems. Um, you know, I think a lot of the larger ERP companies, again, have come out with, uh, or already have, uh, revenue management, revenue recognition modules or functionality. So I'd highly encourage you to, to reach out to your vendor and, and find out more about what they provide, because uh, obviously that's the path of least resistance and probably least cost for, for you as an, an organization. Um, you know, again, you know, automation is critical. Um, I, you know, not having people have to have a hand in every process, having the ability to apply standards and controls and, um, you know, all of that goes a long way in a few areas. One, again, from your auditability. Uh, number two, from your error rate. Uh, number three, from the total cost of transaction and total cost of doing your business, um, all of those pieces, uh, automation really helps drive. Uh, but with that automation, it also has got to have the ability to, to be flexible to your business. And then we talked about you know, some, there are some more flexibility in, in this adoption standard. Uh, but also, as most of you know, I mean, standards change. 
So what, you know, how does that software solution change with you as you, you know, grow as the, you know, potentially they come back and reevaluate components of it? Uh, all of that is very important in looking, again, not only at the today, but, you know, looking at the future state in, uh, far down the road. Um, you know, multi-element arrangements. So if you're bundling, you know, example, if you're bundling goods and services, so if you're a tech company and you're selling software and you're selling pro services, work with it. Or, you know, again, you know, that happens in many industries, but that's just an example that came to my head. Um, you know, you, you could have, you know, multi-element arrangements that, again, overall change very drastically how you recognize revenue and when you recognize revenue and what components you can recognize revenue of and when. So having something that supports how you go to market and how you sell um, is extremely important. Um, something, and we talked about fair values, I and mean, that's something we'll talk about a lot more later, but you know, goods and services, you know, are another example of they may have very different fair value based on how they're bundled, based on what their cost of those goods or services are. So, so having something that really allows you to have a, a fair value calculation based on the, each individual product and or service you put in the marketing you sell to your customers is extremely, extremely important. Um, and again, something that can be, then be changed or modified because again, hopefully you're putting new products or services in the market. You're changing how you do those to be you know, more aligned with your customers, more profitable, whatever that, you know, that adjective uh, looks like. Um, you know, we talked a lot about automation. Um, you know, the other thing is, and, I, and this won't apply to everybody, but, you know, in a lot of cases, contracts change. Um, can't, and, and having that adaptability in a system to be able to modify a contract, whether that is a date, whether that's, again, I'm, I'm upselling, I'm cross-selling, I'm, you know, downselling. Maybe I don't, a client chooses not to take the component of the overall contract. And, and I don't know if this applies to everybody, but I think for the people it does, this is a huge level of complexity um, that, again, probably isn't managed very much today. Um, and, and so I think it's something that as you get further and further into this, it's going to be very critical to make sure that you thought through that, you've identified the process for that, you've implemented that, and lastly, you've got a system and a process that supports it on an ongoing basis. Um, and then obviously, the la you know, you've got to report on things. You've got to, you've got to have, um, you know, the right financial statements. You've got to have the right uh, GL entries. You've got to have, you've got to understand both now what your, your current revenue as well as deferred revenue um, might look like. Uh, and those, uh, all the disclosures we talked about earlier, all of that's got to be uh, available. And then obviously as much automation as you can is, is I think, a huge success factor. Um, and then you know, we talked a lot about changing of contracts. And so having an audit trail, um, so having an audit trail for, Everything that's get, is done. I mean, a lot again, a lot, and this is a, a kind of a, a piece for um, manual. So let's talk about what a system needs. Um, and I'm going to use um, we uh, we as a firm do a lot with with NetSuite, so you'll see some NetSuite stuff in here. But really, this applies directly to any system that you have. So um, we talked about compliance. We talked about a fair value pricing engine. Um, this is probably one of the most kind of critical pieces in that um, it really does allow you to um, calculate the value of each individual element um, that you sell, whether that's a good or a service or a bundle or a training session or you know, whatever it is you, you sell, um, each individual element is going to have a, a fair value price, and to be able to calculate at that level is is very important. Um, you may have to you may have to um, allocate revenue across orders. You may have to consolidate, and I'll show you an example of this later. Um, across multiple orders, you know, we talked about upsell, cross sell, kind of things like that. 
Um, and then really the concept of a revenue plan for many people will be new. Um, but a revenue plan is how is that revenue going to be recognized, you know, ongoing. Uh, so having the right, you know, rules in place, having the right structures in place. Um, we talked about reporting. We talked about, um, you know, everything that goes into your disclosures and reporting and visibility and uh, analytics and everything that goes back to each stakeholder um, and then the needs that they have to, to properly manage their portion of the business. <clears throat> so some key functionality kind of map back into the five-step method um, that we'll go into. I mean, we've got the revenue arrangements. Uh, really, you know, they represent the contracts in the system. That's, that's really, um, you know, your sales orders, your invoices, if you do cash sales at all, if you do refunds, uh, RMAs, credit memos, things like that. All of that is what are all the arrangements that I'm going to have um, and then you know, your elements in there are my performance obligations. What are the lines? What am I really selling? What are the, each individual component that's in that arrangement that I'm, I'm doing and ha that I have to track that? And then obviously for step three, the determined transaction price, we already talked about the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the, the fair value pricing engine on a revenue element basis. So the, again, the ability to track all of this at that individual element item is very, very key. Um, and knowing what am I selling this for? Uh, and and I, obviously everyone does, you know, kind of, you know, ongoing price review and management. And how do I modify that? And how do I, again, tie that back to my fair value um, as I move forward? So knowing those components, I think is, is very, very critical in managing, uh, you know, each, kind of each component. Um, and then, you know, last piece is, is really, you know, your revenue rules um, and your revenue plans. Um, you know, your revenue rules are, you know, when and how can I uh, recognize this revenue? When is my start date? What's my end date? You know, what are my calculations for, you know, being able to recognize an individual component or an individual element? Um, and then, um, you know, the revenue plan is really, when does that hit my jail? Um, what am I going to, you know, what am I going to book in versus what am I going to defer out? And, and having that plan, not only at an element level, not, but across all of your revenue. So understanding, again, what is my revenue plan across my business to know what am I going to book? What am I going to defer? What does that mean? Again, what does that mean to my overall business? And then what does that mean from what I'm reporting to investors or the public or um, so depending on whether you're a public or private company? Um, but all of that information then gets fed out to a stakeholder um, you know, for review. So it's very, very visible information. Uh, so the revenue arrangement, uh, really, as we talked about, it's a it's, it's contract. Um, you know, what we would typically see in a system, and again, in any system, and the screenshots you see is, is messy, but it, again, it's any system, is what's the obligations and what am I going to, um, what have I committed to um, both sell and then what does that revenue plan look like? And, and, each, and as you see, each element is in there, um, rolled up into an overall arrangement. Um, but you can consolidate, um, you know, different revenue sources. So you can have multiple sales orders that come up under a, you know, the same revenue arrangement. You could have uh, an initial sale and an ongoing customer support piece. You can have all these different complex pieces. So again, going back and tying that back into, you know, the earlier part of the conversation of making sure I know all my use cases is extremely important here because you may end up having an initial sale in a, in a customer support transaction that then needs to get tied together that you probably never did that in the past. You may have a product and a service that need to get then, you know, merged together from, an, from a revenue perspective, even though they may even be on separate contracts. Um, so all of these pieces 
need to be understood, they need to be evaluated, they need to be mapped out, and they need to be implemented as you go through this project. So the element, um, so the element really is the detail. I mean, it's, it's each individual element that is, think about a line item on a sales order. Um, you know, it shows like quantity, rate, discount, what, you know, the, the price is, what the actual payment price is. Um, and then all of that then starts getting fed into my fair value calculation, my allocation ratios. Um, so again, and you can have many of these on one uh, revenue arrangement. I mean, it might you might have end up with you know, hundreds if you had a very very complex um, contract um, that then gets recognized individually over a certain period of time. So just think about the element as each line item on that contract that promises a good or uh, good or service. So the next piece is really the fair value. Um, so this is something that you've got to again work with, um, you know, your auditors, your financial team, your you know, um, as to determine for each element and for each I item. Specifically, what is the fair value and how should I calculate that fair value? Because some you may have a, a defined fair value, some you may actually need to calculate based on you know supported methods you may use, you know, uh, vendor specific objective evidence of so VSOE, you may do your best estimate of selling price or ESP, you may use third party evidence. There's, there's, there's others too, but those are kind of the most common ones. Um, so really, this is, is truly an engine that says, how am I going to determine what I should have sold this for and what I'm going to be able to recognize as value for that uh, and what revenue I'm going to be able to recognize for that down at the individual element level. Um, and you can even, again, you may have cost elements into multi-element component um, if you sell things as a bundle, for example, um, or, you know, you may have a, a particular bill of material you, you package together. Uh, all of these pieces, you know, can be consolidated and or separate, depending on, again, your particular use case. So go back to the making sure that you understand what you sell and how you sell it <clears throat> across every single use case in your entire business. So next piece we talk about is the revenue recognition rule. Um, and that's, again, what's your plan look like? How, how are you going to recognize it? What, you know, where is that, uh, the, the data, my start date, my end date? Um, and this goes back to, again, you've talked about your accounting. Uh, this is where really you kind of apply that. You know, am I going to do a straight line? Am I going to do an even period? Uh, is it based on uh, fulfillment? Do I have a, a milestone based or a percent complete date? So there's there's many rules that you can apply as to what are those individual you know steps in the process that allow me to recognize revenue and how is that re how is that going to be determined for each again each element as I move forward? Um, you know, and they're they're really generated. Uh, after the element arrangement is created, um, you know, you're going to have you know, you know, a default piece, or you know, based on you know, your, your typical sale. But you also want to have the ability to have the one-off as much as your business needs it. And the, um, and again, that's going to be very, very individual to you as a firm uh, as to what does that look like. Uh, some people have very standard contract, very standard product. Some people, it's a very customized, very definable uh, construct, uh, and all of that needs to be very well thought out and managed. And how are you going to recognize revenue for each individual element that you sell to your in-state customer or to a partner? Um, so revenue plans. Um, so revenue plans uh, just defines your really is kind of your your high level. 
of when things should be recognized based on those rules that we just talked about, what's going to go into, you know, each month, each quarter, you know, uh, pieces, and then it'll automatically generate the journal entry based on the revenue plans that you have. And, and again, going back, and it ties in all the components, and all of this is very, very intertwined, but the revenue plan is really when, it, when am I going to book this, uh, and, or when is it going to sit out as deferred revenue? Uh, and be able to forecast, <coughs> excuse me, forecast that information. So, again, this is what the underlying will feed the reporting of what is deferred revenue, what is going to be my booked revenue, um, and be able to view all that information and be able to report that, whether that be in a static report or a, a dashboard or whatever mechanism I want to actually report that through. Um, this is that that you know, construct in that structure. So you can see some of the information that's in there. Won't go through it, but really, I can think about it as, um, you know, this is how you control when things hit your books. So reporting. So we've talked a little bit about reporting, but again, some of, some of this may be reporting you already have, and some of it may be reporting that you're, you're it's going to be new to you. Uh, but this is just a, a kind of a very... You know, definitely not an inclusive list of reports, but just a sample of some ones that we see customers um, leveraging. Um, so knowing you know, your deferred revenue by customer, by items, um, and your total revenue by customer, how, what of it is deferred versus what am I able to bill over what time frame and how is that going to happen on a month-by-month -month or quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis. Uh, same thing for item levels. Um, your waterfall again. That's your your forecast. How am I, when when is particular revenue going to hit my books at what numbers based on my backlog, um, and what does that look like? And again, this may be static reporting format. This may be in a dashboard, but this is all very good information that again different stakeholders in your business are going to want to um, know, um, and so. You know, having this level of data, having this level of, level of insight, and having this level of reporting is going to be very, very key to, number one, ensuring you're in compliance with the new standard. Number two, um, you know, providing the visibility into your auditors, your CFO, your CEO, uh, each stakeholder that has a, a revenue component to his or her um, department or business unit. Um, and, and making sure that you can accurately and on demand, you know, really generate this information uh, and track this level of information resulting in the reporting is, is again, going back to kind of the, the waterfall approach of the project-based uh, pieces we've talked about. Um, and then we've talked about roles. Uh, these aren't people. These are just functions. Uh, you may... Again, roll it into someone else's um, current job, but these are these are pieces that you're going to have to make sure you account for. Um, the first is really a revenue manager. Um, you know, they are the ones on a daily basis are going to um, you know, own the rules and the configurations and 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 make sure that the the overall process and the engine is working the way. And then, as your again, as your business changes and evolves, and um, you know making sure that you can update whatever is needed in order to put a new product in the, in the market. Maybe you can change how you do business. Maybe you eliminate a, an aspect of contracting or you add complexity in, but somebody's got to manage this piece. Is, this piece. Um, and then the last piece is really, again, your revenue accountant, uh, you know, making sure that you stay in compliance on the, from the accounting side and um, that you're, you're, you know, as you you change all the other pieces we just talked about, that you you have that uh, tie back to your overall accounting you know, needs, requirements, processes, standards, uh, controls, um, everything along that line. Um, so really, um, I won't go into a lot of depth there, but really, I want to kind of show you what a process flow might look like, and this is a, a pretty simple. Um, order to revenue uh, process flow. It doesn't have allocations or 
you know, in, you know, combinations or allocations or anything along that line. So otherwise, they got to be a, a real eye chart. But really, the idea here is just to show, you, you know, how, what you need to map out, how, you know, the individual pieces and components. And, and as you can see down the left, I just captured one role. But, you know, again, knowing all of this out as part of the implementation project at this level of specificity um, is, is really critical. And it goes into where and how am I capturing the data all the way through how am I generating my reports and doing my analysis from an operational executive perspective on the back end. So everything in this has to be mapped out for each individual use case and each individual um, process within your firm. So the other thing we kind of talked about at a high level is linking orders. So again, this might or might not be applicable to your individual business, but I think it, it happens in a lot where you have, you know, again, a great example that comes to my mind is you may have a product and associated services that come in on separate orders and maybe separate contracts, but need to be linked based on revenue recognition because they cross over. You also may do adjustments to an existing order. You may do a change order. You may change quantity, rate, um, amount. You know, uh, you may do an upsell. Um, you know, all of these pieces now need to be merged into one revenue arrangement. Um, and this is again really critical and something that probably not done very well or very um, cohesively today, based on my experience anyway. Um, but the idea here is that you now have to have the capability and many good revenue recognition products allow this to be done very simply and very um, easily through, you know, the individual uh, system. Uh, but the ability to have a, an arrangement A and arrangement B and then all of a sudden have to develop out an arrangement C based on linking those together and it could be based on milestones. It could be based on anything that you utilize to run your business. So the idea here is, again, have a system that allows that adaptability, that flexibility, that change in an automated or as close to an automated way as possible. Otherwise, all of this becomes a manual process that is subject, again, to your auditors, to your you know, audit process, to errors in how you recognize revenue. Uh, to just manual effort and then the amount and cost and time that you have to spend uh, adhering to this set of processes. Um, so kind of backing, backing up a little bit, talking about some key system functionality, implementation considerations. We talked about use cases, test cases. You talked about your recognition, uh, your rules, your, your method, your period, your start and end date, all these what are the triggers for recognition and revenue? All of these pieces and components are things that you need to look at as you move through each of those stages that we talked about in, in this webinar and making sure that you can map out every individual item in that. And again, that you get each stakeholder to sign off on each of these pieces so that you know that you're meeting the needs of the disparate parts of your business. So in summary, uh, you know, this can be a very complex project, with very, and it does have very large implications to your business. It's how you recognize and report revenue. Um, it can affect many parts of your business. Uh, not just, it's not just a finance project. And I think many people have looked at it as a finance project, but it's, again, it, it can affect sales. It can affect order management. It can affect fulfillment. It can affect a lot of different areas within your business. Um, you know, a lot of what we cover today is what should a, large-scale transformation or enterprise project look like. Um, again, making sure that you have the right people at the table uh, to make sure that you are creating the right process and the right system and the right solution for your business. And then using, you know, really use your time to manage your customer and grow your business. Uh, let the technology handle the compliance. I mean, set it up, think through it, do all the things we talked about, but at the end of the day, you know, there are systems out there that do this and that do this well. Allow them to do it on an ongoing basis and, and get you out of having, you know, manual processes or costly, expensive resource, uh, resources that are 
spending significant portions of their time and day doing nothing but managing a process that you can automate. So with that, we'll go to the next polling question. Thanks, Mike. Um, what level of change do you anticipate to your current system to achieve compliance with the new standard? A, none, B, minor, C, major, D, need new system. Please make your selection now. All right. All right. So this is, uh, yeah, so a lot of, uh, vast majority are minor, um, which is great. Um, uh, speeds uh, adoption, so it's uh, wonderful to hear. So with that, we'll turn it over to Greg. Okay, thank you, Mike. And um, in a few minutes we have left, and we, we do want to uh, save some time for questions and answers. So if you do have any questions, uh, particularly for Mike, Feel free to submit those, and, and we'll have uh, a few minutes here at the end to address those, or we can address, the, address them afterwards, uh, which we do sometimes in, in these webinars. Um, just as a wrap-up, you know, as I said, said in the beginning, this, is, this has been a long series, a four-part series on one topic. So, you know, it you know, basically equates to approximately eight hours of, of training here. Uh, just to get through the new revenue recognition standard. But the time is near. Um, as we, we talked about the, the, uh, the implementation timeframe, and for public companies, that is uh, Q1 of next year, if you are a calendar year. Uh, if you're off your end, you know, you, you've got a little bit more time, but nonetheless, uh, the, the adoption of the standard does does need to be in process for sure on a on an SEC company, a public company. And one of the questions I get asked a lot is when when will it be too late? Uh, you know, for private companies, and a lot of this is going to depend on your industry and and how much impact it's going to have. But certainly, you know, regardless of your industry and how much impact, you don't want to wait until you're preparing for your audit as a private company to start thinking about the standard. Um, my answer would be for a private company, you know, sometime in next summer uh, would be a, a good time. You know, certainly starting to address it now, but certainly by next summer going through the process of, of really implementing, uh, going through the implementation process, which is a lot of what we talked about here today and, and some in the prior session as well. Um, one thing, and we've used Microsoft quite a bit just for various reasons throughout um, throughout the series from a discussion standpoint. I think you know perhaps one of the reasons. I know when Michelle and I first went to training, there was somebody from Microsoft in the in, in the training with us, and um, you know it was very interesting to get their take on it. And they've been actually very very instrumental in in uh, adopting the standard and, and providing feedback to the, to the FASB as well. But in between the last session and this session, um, they, they did actually issue their uh, first quarter 10Q uh, for the fiscal year ending uh, June 30th of uh, 2018. So it wasn't available in our last session. I wasn't able to uh, uh, download that and share that with you, but um, have, have had a chance. They filed a uh, earlier this week, I think, and had a chance to, to really kind of go through that. And um, some interesting elements. I mean, I think I would just recommend that uh, this, this is a good place to look. And, and the other thing I noticed as I go through that through this is they're also adopting the, uh, the new lease standard. So um, just from a standpoint of interest to see how these two standards really uh, what, what, what financial statements may look like after adoption of the new revenue recognition standard and the new leasing standard, uh, this provides a great example to, to take a look at. 
Um, one of the disclosure areas we, we talked a fair amount about is the disaggregation of revenue disclosures. This can be required for public companies and uh, thought it was interesting in, in Microsoft's case, what they, what they did was to refer back to their segment disclosures, which is uh, according to standard, you know, that's, that's all okay. You can do that. You've, uh, in their case, they've already got segment disclosures uh, presented. And what they did was to, to expand upon the pre-existing segment disclosures to get some of the disaggregation of revenue disclosures within there. Um, so a lot of interesting little, little tidbits in there. It kind of, you know, a, a lot of new acronyms, a lot of new terminologies within here. Um, SSP, I think, is, is kind of a new one, standalone selling price. And, uh, you know, some of it's just learning some of this new terminology that's, that's uh, going to be taking place. The other thing, um, in the last se section, we talked about the, the definition of a, a receivable versus contract asset versus contract liabilities. Um, and, and what we've seen in, in practice is, uh, at times, companies will kind of gross up the balance sheet, recognize an accounts receivable and a deferred revenue just because they've issued an invoice. But uh, what the standard does is get into the definition of the receivable to clarify that there has to be an unconditional right uh, to payment upon invoice in order to recognize that accounts receivable. And uh, part, of, part of their disclosure gets into that. And what was interesting to me on that is this one actually – acted in, in reverse in that it, it required them to grow, gross up the accounts receivable versus uh, historical practice because they, they uh, apparently they did conclude that they had an unconditional right uh, based on the contracts that were entered into. So they were able to recognize those receivables earlier than it sounds like they did in historical practice. So. If you are interested, uh, don't have access, you can get all the, the any, any public filings you can get on the SBC website. Website. Feel free to email me. Um, easy enough, I've already got it downloaded. I can just uh, shoot you a PDF of it. Um, or if you have questions on any of the series, feel free to reach out to myself, Michelle, Mike, uh, John Monahan, uh, Megan McFarland from the oil and gas perspective. So. Um, with that, I think uh, let's open it up for any questions and answers we may have, or questions we may have, and hopefully we have the answers for it as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, to submit a question, use the chat box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And if we don't get to your question during the webinar, um, our presenters here will definitely be sure to follow up with you via email. Um, we do have our first question here. Are most systems up to date and ready to handle this new standard? Have you seen any systems that are better than others? I think that one's for you, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot that aren't, um, aren't necessarily implemented um, and a lot that aren't really, um, I guess, as capable. Uh, it covers the, the spectrum. Um, again, I think most of the larger ERP players have a revenue recognition module or revenue recognition functionality built in. Now, whether your firm is implemented or not is a, is a very different story. I think there's a lot of people who uh, have not either purchased or implemented that you know, additional module or additional functionality um, that will need to. Uh, and I think some of the people um, you know, some of the more simple, maybe a QuickBooks or things like that, uh, may have to um, you know, have more manual processes to uh, do it outside of their financial system and then get it into QuickBooks. So I think the larger ERP players have addressed it. Uh, whether firms are purchased or implemented is a very different story. Okay, good. Well, given our time, I want to thank uh, you, Mike, Greg, and Michelle for um, these the series, as well as John and Megan, for their earlier participation. All the time we have for questions now. Um, in a moment, you'll be directed to receive an online evaluation form. Please fill out the form in order to receive your CPE certificate for the course. In order to receive a certificate for CPE, you are required to be connected for a minimum 
of 75 minutes with 75% of the polling questions answered. Please allow up to four business days to receive your CPE certificate. We thank you for attending and have a great day.